This film is the story of Aktiv Chanute's glider flying trials in the Indiana Dunes in 1896 and 1897. As engineer, Aktiv Chanute believed firmly that flight is not improbable. It is just another engineering challenge. The eminent civil engineer Arctif Chanute and his team came to the southern shore of Lake Michigan in 1896 to experiment with flying machines. In true engineering fashion, he developed a biplane glider which became the basis of all modern aviation. The sites where the experiments took place are now part of the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. Who was Chanute? The 20-year-old budding civil engineer came to Illinois in early 1853. His first job as chief engineer was to lay railroad tracks from Peoria, Illinois to the Indiana state line. Most of the countryside was flat. Only one bridge was needed for the railroad to cross a small river near Watsika, Illinois. <coughs> to open the vast United States into the west, the Missouri River needed to be bridged at Kansas City. Chanute accepted the challenge to build the very first bridge across the raging river, even though people generally said that this river could not be bridged. After a four-and-a-half-year innovative construction project with Chanute as chief designer and engineer, the bridge opened in 1869 for rail and road traffic. Kansas City quickly became an active and growing commercial center. Another challenging project. In 1882, Chanute designed the Kinzel Bridge in central Pennsylvania. For 10 years, this was the highest and longest railroad bridge in the world. In his spare time, Chanute frequently wondered, if birds can fly, man should be able to fly as well. And then he fancied to fly like a bird. If he would stand on a high hill, he could take a little run throw up his arms and fly. Mechanical flight or flight by man is certainly within the range of engineering possibilities. There is absolutely nothing irrational in the nature of the problem. But to design the flying machine, Chanut had to learn and then validate the work done by others before he could venture into the unknown. In June of 1896, he was ready. He traveled with his team from Chicago to Millers. This is when aeronautics began. Millers and the dunes are easily reached by train from Chicago. After leaving the train at the Millers station, the group walked north on Lake Street, then crossed the Calumet on a recently erected bridge, and they were in the wilderness of the dune country. The experiments began with a Lilienthal type glider, which was flown first. The newspaper clipping shows Augustus Sering in flight with a team watching. But this glider was difficult to control and was quickly discarded. In his long career as a civil engineer, Chanute had learned that building a safe bridge requires sturdy trussing. The same applies to a flying machine, which needs to be rigid but flexible. So Chanute employed the same trussing on his next flying machine design as he used on his bridges. The engineer's next design was a work in progress. The starting configuration of the catered multiplane glider shows two sets of wings in the front, two sets in the center, and two sets in the back. The next step uses two sets in the center and four sets in the back as a tail. The next step is five sets of wings in the center and one set in the back. And this was the best of all configurations. With this configuration, excellent jumps or flights of almost 100 feet in length were made. But the engineer was thinking if there is possibly a better way. However, it did not come out as well as the previous one. Instead of using a wind tunnel as we would do today, Chanute brought along several bags of down feathers 
spread them along the front of the aircraft and watch the wind push the feathers over or under the wing surfaces. With the knowledge gained, he designed the next flying machine. It is curious that this reporter thought that the feathers were part of the flight machine. Many years later, he recalled that those first machines were most strangely constructed. The first was a light framework designed to resemble the skeleton of the bird and covered with feathers. It proved to be an utter failure, but provided Chanute with a theory upon which he constructed his next glider. The success of the Katy did convince Chanute that he was on the right track. Writing to his friend Edward Hoffaker, I'm about to return to the Sandhills to try some more experiments and may have something interesting to report in a week or two, or I may have a failure. In late August of 1896, Chanute and his team took a sailing vessel to the area just north of the Dune Park Station, where the dunes were a bit higher to do more experiments. The team set up camp and assembled Paul Mutasov's Albatross, the first flying machine to experiment with. It is interesting to take a little bit of closer look at the people who joined Chanute and his team trying to get the Albatross airborne. The 190 pound Albatross flying machine did not fly, but reporters from around the world were fascinated and newspapers gave this craft and its designer much colorful media coverage. But this craft never actually flew. Chanute's next design was a simple triplane, which quickly became the elegant biplane we know today. The photo shows Chanute holding the glider, but he did not attempt to fly. The flying was done by Augustus Herring and Bill Avery, however several reporters and guests were also allowed to try this new sport. The following year in the summer of 1897, Herring and Avery rebuilt the glider to be sold to Matthias Arnold, a banker from Elmira, New York. They flew again in the high dunes north of Dune Station. One week later, Arnold went home and Chanute and several friends came by train, enjoyed the simple camp life and lots of flying activity. The longest reported flight was 359 feet in length and 14 seconds in duration. But everybody appears to have had lots of fun doing so. Chanute continued his aeronautical studies and recorded all pertinent data in his notebook. He stood near the landing site to measure duration and length of every flight. He even documented the flight attempts by visiting engineers. But sometimes the flight did not go as planned and the glider landed in the trees. Fortunately, no one was hurt. This biplane or double-deck glider design was a winner. Several reporters were allowed to fly the glider, which naturally resulted in much good media coverage, which was also published overseas. Even though his biplane design was a success, Chanute never claimed to have invented the airplane. He wanted someone else to take his design and make it perfect, but also remember him as one who furnished the prototype. In 1899, a bicycle maker from Dayton wrote to the Smithsonian Institution asking for information on aeronautics. Half a year later, he joined the long line of want-to-be aeronauts who contacted Chanute looking for advice and input. In his first letter, Wilbur Wright wrote, In the apparatus I intend to employ, I make use of the torsion principle. It is very similar to the double-deck machine with which the experiments of yourself and Mr. Herring were conducted in 1896 and 97. During his knowledge as a mentor, Chanute soon became friends with the Wright brothers and joined them in camp in 1902. 
A year later, on 17 December 1903, they achieved the first sustained powered control flight. And months later, in September and October 1904, Bill Avery flew Chanute's last glider design at the World Fair in St. Louis. Now development in aviation leaped ahead in giant steps. The age of the flying machine had passed. The age of the airplane had arrived. And the beginnings of American aviation that actually paved the way to powered flight can be found right here in northern Indiana. Chanute's simple glider design was not forgotten. The Chanute Air Museum in Ventura, Illinois owned a replica. But when the museum was forced to close its hangars, all artifacts had to go to new homes on short notice. The old Chanute glider traveled in a modern glider trailer from Ventura to Chesterton, Indiana to its new forever home, the Indiana Dunes Visitor Center. This craft is a silent reminder that the first successful tests of heavier-than-air flying machines were made in the area that is now the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore.